Hi everyone, welcome to August Highlights from the WaterWise Demonstration Garden. My name is Katherine Moravec and I'm a Senior Water Conservation Specialist here at Colorado Springs Utilities. And so thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're going to be talking about what is um, in bloom and looking great in midsummer here at the Demonstration Garden. So let's go ahead and get started. So what I'm going to be talking about today is just a, a few tips about visiting the garden and then I'll be reviewing 10 of the top performing plants that look amazing in July and August. And then I will cover two tips for fall and then talk about some of our end of the season webinars that we'll be offering. So feel free to visit our demonstration gardens for ideas. We have two demonstration gardens that we offer to the public. The primary garden is located at 2855 Mesa Road. It's very close to Coronado High School. And the other garden is the Cottonwood Creek Demonstration Garden, right in front of the Cottonwood Creek Recreation Center at 3920 Dublin Boulevard. Both of these gardens are open during daylight hours every day of the year and are free and open to the public to visit. And they're great because you can get some wonderful ideas about what to do with your yard. You can look at plants that look really amazing. Um, and you can certainly um, join us and ask questions if you are able to catch some of the staff outside. We can always walk around with you and show you some things that might be of interest to you as well. At the Mesa Garden, we have about two acres of demonstrations that showcase around 300 different types of plants. So it's a fantastic place to see what grows well here in Colorado Springs. These, uh, this area was installed in 1990 to 1991. So we're coming up on 30 years of having this WaterWise demonstration garden available to the public. The Cottonwood Garden is a lot newer. It was installed in 2006. It's a smaller garden and it receives less maintenance. So it can be a really wonderful resource for people who live on the Northeast side of Colorado Springs or if you're looking to find low maintenance plants. So certainly give that a demonstration garden a try. Now, for those of you that are out and about in the um, Colorado Springs area, you may notice that there are many landscapes that sort of go through what I call a midsummer slump. And by that, what I mean is that they just don't have a lot of color. There's not a lot of interesting things going on in the landscape. And I think that this happens primarily because most people go shopping in the spring and they purchase their plants when those plants are in bloom and they look amazing in the first few months of the year. And then once they're done flowering, um, many people really don't go shopping in the middle of summer or towards the end of the growing season. And so um, they tend to just naturally not buy plants that look great at this time of year. So, but I will say that if you go around and look at natural areas in Colorado Springs, July and August, especially if we've gotten some rain during the summer, it is such a beautiful time. The grasses, the yellow flowering plants, and the silver leafed plants, they create this beautiful tapestry of just amazing color and texture. This is when most of the vegetation has reached its peak growth and it still looks really wonderful. So what I'd like to encourage you to do is take inspiration from the natural areas and work some of those plants into your landscape. Many of the plants that I'm going to be talking about tonight are actually native plants that really look amazing at this time of year. And not only can you incorporate native plants into your landscape to really get you that mid to late season interest in color, but you can also um, incorporate some of the improved cultivars. So there's been many plant breeders and horticulturists that have taken our native plants and worked on them and just selected cultivars that maybe are a little longer lasting in terms of flowering or form. Maybe they're a bit more tidy. So they come from native plant roots, but they've just been selected for more landscape value. And those can be fantastic additions to your landscape. And if you really work on this for a while, you can get that color and texture and late season interest into your landscape. This is a photograph that I took of our WaterWise demonstration garden this morning. And you can see that our garden is really bursting with colors of, and bright flowers at this time of year. 
And I will say that the Waterwise Demonstration Garden on Mesa Road is a fantastic resource. Um, the people who designed it and planted it and have taken care of it over the years have really masterfully created a landscape that looks beautiful in August and September on into October and November. So it's a wonderful place to come visit in the fall. So I'd certainly encourage you to do so. So what I'm going to do tonight is talk about some of the magnificent yellow flowering plants that are in their top form at this time of year. Then I'm also going to talk about some silver leafed plants and then I'm last I'm going to talk about ornamental grasses and hopefully this will give you some ideas of plants that you can work into your landscape. So the first plant I'm going to talk about is Black Eyed Susans. This is a cultivar of Black Eyed Susans that is sold widely throughout the Colorado Springs area. It's very easy to find in local nurseries and it's uh, actually planted in quite a few landscapes as well. So this is a good one to work into your landscape. It has these bright yellow daisy-like flowers with the black um, center that's kind of a cone in the middle. And that color is so bright and beautiful and eye-catching. And it's got this gold color that looks amazing if you plant Russian sage behind it or maybe even blue mist spirea. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful plant. It is about one to two feet tall and it will spread and fill in any bare areas of your uh, planting bed over time. So certainly take that into consideration. Here at the Waterwise Demonstration Garden, we actually dig out plants because it will spread over time. Um, so that's a good thing. And then um, if it spreads too much, just feel free to take it, take it out. Now I will say that Black Eyed Susan is not necessarily an extremely waterwise plant. It really performs best with twice a week watering. And so make sure that it gets that consistent moisture or it will wilt. At our demonstration garden, the years when we've been really hot and dry, it will wilt, it survives, it maybe is a bit shorter and maybe not quite as many flowers, but it will persist throughout the years. And this year it's just absolutely fantastic. Now, one that we have at the Waterwise Demonstration Garden that is maybe a little more unique is called Gray-Headed Prairie Coneflower. Now, there is a smaller prairie coneflower that is bright gold and often ranges into red. It's a native plant and it's really beautiful. This particular one is actually a Midwestern wildflower and it's a lot taller than our native um, prairie coneflower. But it's a great plant to work into your garden. You can grow it from seeds, so it's a fantastic addition. The nice thing about this plant is that when it's in flower, the butterflies will um, take advantage of the nectar. And then when it produces its seeds, if you leave the cones on the plant, which is that you know gray um, portion right here, then the birds can actually benefit from the seeds. So a multi-season plant to plant for um, supporting wildlife in your yard. Um, now this plant, as I mentioned, you can grow from seed and it will seed around in your garden, but if you get too much of it, you can certainly pull it out. But this is something that you will see in bloom at our Waterwise Demonstration Garden today. And in fact, this is what um, the front part of our garden looks like. You can see how we've had all these black eyed Susans spread along the front of this border and the taller gray headed prairie coneflower in the back. Now, if you were a very strict landscape designer, you might not necessarily plant yellow next to yellow, um, but it really is an amazing combination that is sort of informal and um, naturalistic and really just kind of honors this beautiful gold season that we have here in Colorado Springs. Now the next plant I'd like to talk about is called broom snakeweed. Um, this is a native plant to Colorado and you'll see it not only on the Eastern Plains, but it goes naturally up to about 8,000, 8,500 feet in the mountains in the front range. It's about one to two feet tall and wide. It is a little dome of green leaves throughout the year, but in August, you get these star-like clusters of flowers that cover the whole entire plant. And this thing is as tough as nails. It is very drought tolerant. 
you know, of course survives in totally unirrigated areas, but you can buy it as a landscape plant. And if you can, I would certainly encourage you to take a look at it because it is just this tidy little dome of growth. And then with this burst of color towards the later end of the season, it's fantastic. Here in this part of our garden, you can see it growing next to little blue stem grass, which is the bluer um, stemmed um, grass, <laughs> which is why it's called little blue stem, right here on the left, which um, this was just a natural place that this all kind of seeded together. And then there's fringed sage in the back. So these blue and silver colors combined with this yellow flowering dome is just wonderful. Now, most of the time I usually say, do not count on not irrigating your landscape indefinitely, because I really feel that most plants need periodic moisture, even if they're very, very xeric, they need periodic moisture in order to um, look landscape quality, uh, especially if we're in a hot and dry period. Now, broom snakeweed might be an exception to that. It's very xeric and once it's established, you can let it be and water it occasionally or maybe not even water it at all. So this would be one for a very low water area. Um, but keep an eye out for it. You might have to look at a native plant sale or even contact the Native Plant Society and see where you could buy it. But it's a wonderful one if you can get a hold of it. Another plant I'd like to talk about is Rocky Mountain Zinnia. This is also called Prairie Zinnia. It's a little tiny ground cover that's about four inches tall, but this will spread throughout an area and really fill in the front of a plant border. It's fantastic in rock gardens, um, cactus gardens, any place where it's hot and dry and full sun. The thing I love about this plant is that it blooms from June all the way through October and once again performs well with very little irrigation. So this would do well in a naturalistic garden, a rock garden, even just um, an area where you have a pathway and you want to plant up against the sides. Um, I have this at my house. I've got very sandy soil and it has survived in areas where I don't water all that much. I do want to point out that um, Rocky Mountain Zinnia, even though it's a very short plant, it will spread and sort of cascade over certain areas of a landscape. So it can be really nice planted on the edge of a boulder or a rock where it can grow around and um, create this beautiful spilling effect. Um, here's a picture that, another picture that I took today, and I wanted to show you how Rocky Mountain Zinnia is really the highlight of our cactus and succulent garden at this time of year. So in the spring, uh, the grasses are small, uh, the Rocky Mountain Zinnia is just coming up and is green leaves, and it's the, the cacti that are the star of the show. They have these huge, really beautiful multicolored flowers, and they're in their top condition. Well, they're all done now. Um, and they're just hanging out and, you know, waiting for next year. But Rocky Mountain Zinnia is, um, because it's planted in and amongst all these plants that have spring interest, it is really um, creating this highlight when it's so hot and dry. Now in this garden, we have a plant called Sotol right here, which looks a little bit like yucca but it's got um, these toothed edges and is a really beautiful architectural plant. Now this one does get these spikes of whitish flowers. The flowers are a little interesting. I mean, I really like the architectural value of this plant a little better rather than its flowers. And then we have undaunted ruby muley grass over here. Now we've talked about that plant a lot, but this is a fantastic ornamental grass. It's just starting to flower right now. So as we move into September, this undaunted ruby muley is really going to take over the star of the show. It will get covered by these light and airy pink flowering seed heads. So that will be fantastic. But in this middle season, it's really the Rocky Mountain Zinnia or the Prairie Zinnia that is looking the best and creating the ornamental color value in this landscape. So don't forget about it. It's a great filler plant. 
Um, now I want to talk about some of the stunning silver plants that um, naturally grow in our area that can make such an amazing addition to your landscape. One thing I love about these silver plants is that they are really deer resistant. So for the most part, rabbits don't eat them, deer don't eat them. They tend to have a strong scent in their leaves. And so they're really resistant to herbivory, which is really nice. So the first one I want to talk about was is tall rabbit brush. Tall rabbit brush grows um, about two to six feet tall, depending on the plant you get. Uh, because it's a native plant, there's a lot of variability in the height and the form and the width. Uh, but it is really, really beautiful. This is what it looks like earlier in the growing season. And you can see it paired here with this sunset hyssop or hummingbird mint. That's this one right here with the beautiful spikes of pink flowers. And then we have some blonde ambition blue grama grass over here. But what makes these two plants look so nice is this gorgeous backdrop of this tall rabbit brush. Now, this is a native plant that uh, will grow from here all the way to Pueblo and even farther south. It grows on the Eastern Plains. So to me, any place you see a juniper that you know might have been planted in the 70s or 80s or 90s, the bigger junipers that are you know hanging out in all these yards that we have, if you wanna replace those, think about, if it's relatively sunny, think about putting tall rabbit brush in there. It's just as low maintenance, it's, um, just a lighter color so it won't be quite as dark as those older junipers and then you'll get the flowers as well. So the flowers start showing up in August. It's just coming into bloom right now and you get this pop of gold that just um, occurs on the clusters uh, and clusters on the tips of all of these branches. And so this whole entire plant will burst into gold and those flowers support a lot of bees, native insects and butterflies. So if you like painted lady butterflies, put in a tall rabbit brush because they will flock to it as late season food. All right, now I did want to say, as I talked about earlier, that there are some cultivars of our native plants that horticulturists and plant beaters, breeders have developed. Baby blue rabbit brush is one of those. So remember the tall blue rabbit brush is about two to six feet tall and there's lots of variability. Well, this is an improved cultivar of our native rabbit brush that is tidy, it's compact, and it's small. It's only about 12 inches tall, and over time it'll grow to be about three feet wide. This is what it looks like in the early season, and it just is very compact and tidy and looks great. So if you're looking for a small shrub and you've got a hot, dry location where you have full sun, this is a really wonderful shrub to think about. What's nice about this one, it is coming into bloom right now. So once again, you know, as we're heading into this um, early fall, late summer period, this is a great plant to bring extra color. Just like the taller rabbit brush, at the tips of all the branches, there are these clusters of yellow flowers. So you can see that we've put it here, right in front of these beautiful boulders. We have another one tucked right here. Um, and then we have another one over here. So especially along our frontage where we're right up against Mesa Road, we've used a lot of baby blue rabbit brush because it looks great in the um, early season. You get this pop of color right now. And then um, it holds a really nice form all throughout the winter. And what we do is we just shear it back with some hedge trimmers um, in February and March, and then it's rejuvenated and ready to go. So low maintenance as well. Now this one I wanted to show you, this is a picture just from an informal pathway here at the Waterwise Demonstration Garden. And it's this mix of different rabbit brush plants. We have some taller plants that are about three feet tall over here. And um, if you are buying this at a nursery, this might be sold as dwarf blue rabbit brush. It might be blue rabbit brush. You're just buying the native. And you can see that this is just starting to get the flowers opening it on it. But what a beautiful silvery color. And then we've got over here some smaller plants that are baby blue rabbit brush. You can see this one over here as well. And they're planted towards the edges of the pathway. They're really in full bloom. And they have a little bit of a darker green color right now. 
So you can see that there's variability in these plants, but you know, who would think of just planting their pathway with rabbit brush and it would look good? And it actually does. So don't forget about this plant. It's something to think about, um, especially in low maintenance areas, hot and dry, low water, low maintenance. That's a really good place to start. Another plant I wanted to talk about is Western sagebrush. So while rabbit brush is really native to the Eastern Plains of Colorado, um, Western sagebrush is more native to the Western slope of Colorado. So as you move into the shrubland, you know, from the, the high mountain areas, you're gonna see a lot of Western sagebrush. So once again, a plant that can survive and look good on minimal water and it has silvery leaves and kind of an irregular shape. But to me, this is such a quintessential Colorado plant that I love landscapes that incorporate Western sagebrush. It has these light silver leaves all year round and then right now it's starting to flower. So this particular plant, believe it or not, is actually in flower right now. It just looks like more silver branches so that the appearance doesn't change dramatically. Um, but it's just such a nice, light, airy feeling, um, and it's a great backdrop plant in your landscape. It does look really nice if you pair it with maybe other plants that have dark green leaves or needles. So for example, um, you can just barely see in this picture, but there's a pine tree right next to it. And because you've got this dark green here, paired with this light silver, that contrast makes both plants look really beautiful. You can also pair this with plants that have red leaves. So some people really like the burgundy and silver combination. So things like a summer wine nine bark or even a barberry might look really nice with Western sagebrush. But I love this plant because it needs very little irrigation. So once you get it established, um, you can um, only water it on demand if you need to. And we have it in areas that we don't actually water it at all. So another one that is very xeric and well adapted to our climate. I also love the way that Western sagebrush smells after a big rainstorm. It just smells so beautiful and really brings that Colorado scent into your landscape. Now here's an area of our parking lot that we actually didn't plant intentionally. This is where we've put a lot of um, leftover plants and some of our leftover rocks. And you can see in this area, you've got the tall blue rabbit brush starting to come into bloom right here. We have two Western sagebrush plants right here. This is again rabbit brush um, in this section. And then we have silver buffalo berry which is a very large shrub or maybe even a small tree, depending on how you prune it. So these three native plants are just pairing really well together, especially when you put a rock in there and you have a backdrop of a pinion pine. So all very native plants, um, but boy, what an amazing combination. Even if you just took this as um, shrubs that you could make some structure out of in your landscape and then maybe you add some flowering perennials in here or some ornamental grasses this is such a great backbone and in fact if you've ever been to the gardens at kendrick lake in lakewood it's a very xeric sort of western um, garden where they have a lot of berms they use rabbit brush and sagebrush and um, some evergreens as the major backbone of their garden. It's really worth a trip. It's open to everybody because it's located in a public park. So certainly take a look at that. All right, let's move on to the next silver leafed plant. That is fringe sage. So once again, a native plant that occurs quite often in our location. Um, you may have seen it many times. If you go out hiking or you go up camping, you'll notice this little gray fuzzy plant that has this strong scent that's really attractive. Um, it is, that's fringe sage. And then when it starts to flower, just like the Western sage brush, it sends up, up these spikes of silver flowers that um, kind of stick up and above the base fuzzy leaves. Um, it's about 12 inches tall and wide. And I love this plant because it works really well 
and rock gardens and naturalistic landscapes, but it also looks really great as a filler. So by that, what I mean is it's something that you can plant in and amongst other plants um, and keep repeating it so that it brings the whole design um, into a more unified state. So this is our dwarf conifer rock garden. So if you come to the Waterwise demonstration garden, you will see the amphitheater right on the right over here. And then we have this sort of terraced area where we've just put some boulders in um, that have natural lichen growing on them that have this really light blue and dark lichen that really is beautiful contrast. Um, this is how we dealt with this slope. We Rather than putting in some very blocky retaining walls, we put in these boulders that had the lichen. And then we put in some dwarf evergreens. So here we have a dwarf pinion pine in this location right here. Over here, we have a dwarf mugo pine, and up here, this is a, a dwarf scotch pine. So those create sort of the um, backbone, the rocks, which look the same year round, and then the evergreens, which also have a similar appearance throughout the year. And then we tucked in some ornamental grasses right over here. These are native grasses. Uh, we have another plant called Hubrix blue star, which actually has light blue flowers in the spring. And this plant turns a bright, bright gold in the fall, almost like the color of aspens. So this is a really beautiful flowering perennial right in this location. And then we have Jones's buckwheat. So yet another native plant that has this little base of um, green leaves. And then in August, it sends up these clouds that almost look like baby's breath. So a really nice plant. But if you go and visit this garden, what you're going to see throughout the whole entire area is fringed sage. So it's this understated little plant that you can see we have a little patch right here, but it's all throughout here and it's all throughout the front. And what I love about it is that it ties in with these evergreens, the grasses and the lichen on the boulder in such a Colorado specific way that it just makes this garden look and feel like a Colorado landscape. So rather than taking all native plants and just plopping them in an area, what we did instead was take those dwarf evergreens, put in the boulders, put in the ornamental grasses. We do have a few flowers in there, but then tie it all together by planting some silver leafed plants like fringe sage in this case. So at this point, what I'd like to do is move on to some ornamental grasses. And then when they cover this section, I'll just give you two planting tips um, and watering tips for fall. And then we can open it up for any questions that you might have. Well, I love ornamental grasses. So ornamental grasses are different from lawn grasses or native grasses because um, we let ornamental grasses grow up as a clump. We don't mow them or string trim them except for once a year in the spring to clean them up. So they are amazing. And a landscape really doesn't feel like it's in Colorado to me, unless it includes ornamental grasses. The ornamental grasses that I love um, the most are many of our native grasses because they just perform the best. So uh, the Blonde Ambition Blue Grama, that's this particular grass right here that has the little eyelash um, seed heads on it. Um, I really like little blue stem a lot, which I showed you in the previous picture, a little picture of it, um, and the undaunted ruby muley grass. We have talked about these three grasses quite a bit, um, and so I don't want to uh, repeat that information too much, but if you come to the demonstration garden, you can see all of them right now. They're really starting to come into their a more, most glorious state, which is when they create a lot of um, flowers and seed heads. You know, the, seed, the flowers on grasses are so tiny. So um, when you see these things come up, I just call them seed heads because there'll be a little tiny flower that emerges that stays out for about a week. It's just this kind of little tiny yellow thing that droops down. And then after that, it, the seeds are maturing inside of that structure. So those three I really like. And then the Mexican feather grass. The Mexican feather grass is this one with this very fine texture. And you can see it popping up here and here and here and here. Now um, we have planted quite a bit of the Mexican feather grass throughout the Waterwise demonstration garden. 
It's native to New Mexico, Arizona, so it does pretty well here. Um, but it does create a lot of seedlings. So if you don't want to remove seedlings over time, you might want to steer clear of that grass because it does seed around. It's not terrible um, for us, but some gardeners just don't like the extra work. So this is an area that we installed in 2019, and I just wanted to walk you through it a little bit. So the way that this was installed was we actually bought um, uh, potted pl plants of ornamental grasses, and you can see that those are these larger ones here. So we have the, the Blonde Ambition Blue Grama grass that was planted as potted plants around these boulders. We also installed some wildflowers, um, both as seed and as potted plants. I think the most successful ones have been the ones that have been installed as potted plants, just because they were bigger plants. The one that's done really well is butterfly weed right here. It's the orange one. Um, and if you walk up closer to it, it looks a lot more like this. And it just adds that pop of color. But what we did here is we actually installed Sundancer buffalo grass from seed all around the area where we didn't have the potted plants. And so when that germinated, it filled in and kind of created um, a solid cover on the soil around the areas that we um, grew from potted plants. The nice thing about this area is that it is extremely low maintenance. So all we're planning to do is to come in in the spring and mow the buffalo grass down as low as we can get it and then come in with hedge trimmers and cut all of this back. There's no shrubs in here that we have to be careful about. So this is really clean it up in the spring and then water it periodically throughout the summer. Um, and that's all we have to do in this area. Um, and then we do have a question that says, do we have milkweed for monarchs? Yes, we do have showy milkweed, which is the one that I believe the monarch larvae feed on. Um, I don't personally see monarch larvae feeding on those in our garden, but I do believe they do so throughout Colorado Springs. So um, showy milkweed is the one that you want to get if you're interested in supporting the monarch larvae. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide here. If I can get that. There we go. All right. So I just wanted to talk about two grasses that we haven't talked very much about this year. The first one is called Giant Sacaton. This is a grass that is native to New Mexico and it is big. It's about five to seven feet tall and wide and it grows um, mostly throughout the year as kind of just a fountain of leaves. And then now it's in full bloom where you have these beautiful plumes that stick up over the grass. I really like this plant because there's very little irrigation required. Um, one time I tried to dig up a giant Sacaton grass and that was a huge futile effort because it has enormously thick, strong roots that anchor it to the soil and then store water when it's, um, it's for dry periods. So once you've got this plant in the ground, it will do really well even if we get hot and dry periods. And I think it's a fantastic substitute for maiden grasses. So the miscanthus um, that you see oftentimes sold in local nurseries, even you know at Home Depot and Lowe's, this can make a better substitute for that just because it's so much more tolerant to our hot dry weather. Here's another picture of giant Sacaton where you have evergreens in the background and these beautiful plumes are just so such a nice contrast against the backdrop of evergreens um, that it's a wonderful thing to to plant. Um, it also looks really nice against silver plants. So if you wanted to pair that maybe with the rabbit brush and the Western sage, that could be a really, really nice thing to do. The one thing I'll say about giant Sacaton is I would give it some space. So when I've seen it look its best is when it's really hasn't been crowded by a lot of plants around it. It kind of needs, you know, a good, um, 10 foot radius to really have the space to become this glorious 
grass. If you tuck it in there and crowd it with other plants, it really just doesn't ever get the space to have the nice arching form that is such a benefit to it. Uh, another grass I'd like to talk about is Northwind switchgrass. So switchgrass is a native grass to this area in Colorado Springs. And if you go out into like the Briargate area or even up maybe into Glen Eagle, you'll see it in the natural grasslands, but it's quite small and um, oftentimes will just be growing in little depressions. But it has been widely cultivated as an ornamental plant. There's lots of cultivars of switchgrass out there. You have um, heavy metal switchgrass, you have Prairie Sky, you have Shenandoah, and those are all really nice cultivars. But this one is my favorite. The reason I like it is that it has these beautiful blue-green leaves that um, persist really throughout most of the growing season, and it has a very upright form. This is a little unique for switchgrasses because many switchgrasses over time can kind of create a big patch and they will flop a little bit or just have a little bit more irregular form. But this one is nice and tidy and upright. And then starting in August, it sends up these beautiful plumes of flowers and then the whole entire plant will turn a bright yellow fall color. So to me, this is a beautiful plant that's about five to six feet tall. And if you plant it in a group, it is a really, really attractive switchgrass. So for a native grass, um, this is a wonderful cultivar. Um, you might just have to ask for it by name at your local nursery, uh, just to make sure that you're getting that particular cultivar. Now we are doing some planting of some additional uh, switchgrasses that we're gonna be testing this fall. We're gonna plant Ruby Ribbons and then Cheyenne Sky. Those will be, both be planted along the front part of our garden between Mesa Road and the front sidewalk. And so keep an eye on those and see how those perform for us um, because those may be other good options for Colorado Springs. We'll just have to see how they do. Okay, and then the last plant I wanted to talk about was the Tannenbaum Mugo Pine. So this is a plant I've been watching for quite a few years now and I wanted to talk about it because it is what they call a semi-dwarf evergreen tree. So many of us have smaller yards and we can't pack in these large evergreens like a big Colorado blue spruce or something like that, but we really need the screening and the structure that evergreens provide for us. And so Tannenbaum Yugo Pine is one that we planted in our Waterwise demonstration garden in 2015, I believe. So these two are about six years old. Um, they're supposed to be about 10 to 13 feet tall and five to seven feet wide. Um, and I think they're just a really nice, tidy, smaller, dark green evergreen tree. And so I'd like to propose that they, you know, are a great substitute for upright junipers. I mean, I really like upright junipers in the right setting. Um, sometimes they will have some branch damage just due to catching uh, heavy, wet snow. And these haven't done that. Um, now it is a very traditional dark green color, uh, but they've been very water wise. They've, we water them once a week with drip irrigation and they seem to be doing just fine. So certainly something to consider and definitely you can find these locally for sale. All right, so now what I'd like to do is just go ahead and share with you two fall landscape tips and um, tell you about our last two webinars for the growing season. And then, um, then you'll have the rest of your evening to, to work on your landscape. <laughs> um, but the first thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, it's really easy for all of us to just keep watering as we've been watering throughout midsummer. And we still are in a very warm period. But as the weather starts to cool down, it is a good idea to water less often. So if you've been watering your lawn three days a week, as the weather starts to get into the 70s pretty regularly, think about reducing that to two days a week. Um, and then even as we move into October, you could even maybe water once per week. Now I will say it's very important to water consistently throughout the fall. Sometimes what I see people doing is that as soon as the kids go back to school, 
Um, I know I want to be thinking about other things too. And so it's really easy to kind of forget about your yard. But make sure you're consistent about watering because oftentimes our uh, weather in the fall can be warm and dry for a long period of time. And our landscape plants are preparing to go into dormancy for the winter. We want to make sure that as they go into dormancy, they're well hydrated and ready to make it through the long dry winters that we have. So if you can water consistently, that'll be really good for your landscape. Especially if you can do that through mid-October, that would be wonderful. Now it doesn't mean that you have to water a lot. It just means just continue to water for the same amount of time that you normally do. Just as the weather cools down, space those watering days farther and farther apart. And that way you can achieve some water savings, but still keep your plants well hydrated as they're preparing to go into dormancy. Um, the next thing I wanted to point out is that fall, it can be a wonderful time to plant. So um, I don't know about you, but my kids went back to school this week and I feel like I've got a little bit of free time. Um, and I know that there's a lot of local nurseries that ha still have quite a few good plants available for sale and they're starting to discount them a little bit. So if you have areas that you want to plant this fall, go ahead and do it. I mean, I've planted all the way up until November, but the thing that you need to keep in mind is that it's with new plants, especially it's very important to be consistent about watering them. So if you know that you don't want to be consistent with watering your plants throughout the fall and into the winter, then maybe spring might be a better time for you to plant. But if you're feeling pretty diligent and you know you can be consistent about watering, then fall is a fantastic time to plant, um, especially because uh, the soils are warm and so you'll get good root growth um, before winter. Just make sure you're consistent about the watering and do water uh, once per month throughout the winter months from November to April um, if we haven't gotten much natural precipitation. That's very important, especially for trees and shrubs. So with that, I wanna thank you very much for your time this evening. I really appreciate you joining us. I hope this has been helpful to you. Thanks again for your time and have a great evening.